Okay, before we begin uh, the last session, uh, and I hand it over to the capable hands of Louise Kellogg, I just wanted to say everyone should have gotten a survey in their packet, which is a purple sheet. Please fill that out and put it in the wooden box by the table right out front here, because uh, we actually read those to decide how to advertise this in the future and other administrative things. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Louise Kellogg, who will close out the entire uh, meeting uh, uh, after these two talks. Uh, so I probably won't address you again. Thank you all for coming. And uh, I think this was a really exceptional teachers conference. The topic was excellent. So I'd like to thank Jeff Marcy one more time for his coordination. Thank you, Greg. I'm, I'm really pleased to be introducing these last two speakers. I think the talks are going to be really exciting and, uh, and you know, should be a nice capstone to, the, to an excellent day of talks. So uh, we have two speakers in this last session. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Dawn Sumner from the University of California, Davis. So she's my colleague at Davis. And uh, Dawn uh, got her bachelor's degree from Caltech and her PhD from MIT. Uh, she works on, uh, on research environments in the early Earth and, uh, and um, especially the evolution of bacteria, including the origin of uh, photosynthesis. Uh, in the last uh, few years, she's been working extensively in, on um, modern systems in uh, life in sub-ice lakes in Antarctica, and I think she's going to show you some really interesting uh, pictures and also talk about uh, what, what that looks like with the idea of, of looking at analogs for early life. And she's also a member of the Mars Science Laboratory, which uh, involves... Um, uh, directing, basically uh, helping uh, with the uh, rover Curiosity that's on Mars right now that's investigating ancient environments in the Gale Crater of Mars. And so she'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Dawn also is a, uh, is a really it does a lot of outreach, so she has blogs about her adventures in Antarctica, her scientific and, and uh, travel adventures in Antarctica and also on Mars. And so you might want to check those out. And so uh, she's very active in, in uh, reaching out to the public in that way. And she um, is very engaged in bringing uh, people of all backgrounds and uh, into science and, and mentoring them to success in their science careers. And her talk today, uh, Are We Alone in the Universe, is adapted from the Carl Sagan lecture that she gave at the uh, American Geophysical Union meeting last December. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dawn. So thanks, Louise. So uh, I got into geology because I liked field trips and I liked camping. And I was, uh, as a sophomore year, I was going physics or geology, and I just decided that I, I really wanted to go crazy places, which physicists also do, but that wasn't obvious from my lab classes <laughs> at the time. And uh, so I didn't really start out with a very keen interest on life and what it does. But everything on Earth has been affected by life. And you just take a deep breath and appreciate that oxygen. That comes from bacteria. This is not extraterrestrial life. This is photosynthetic bacteria that are growing in a lake in Antarctica. It has about two meters of ice uh, on top and liquid water underneath. Enough light gets through during the summer that you can have this photosynthetic life. If you go out and look at the lagoon over here, you don't see anything like this because there are a whole bunch of larger organisms eating the bacteria. So there are worms and fish and all those things that sort of disrupt the microbial life. But in Antarctica, because of the history of, of ice ages, all the large organisms have gone extinct. And there's liquid water but you don't have the fish and worms. In one lake, we found a new species of copepod, which is a millimeter long, and it's the top of the food chain, and it eats bacteria, <laughs> and that's it, <laughs> right? So, so when I 
it was, so I first started studying these uh, lakes um, because a friend of mine saw my pictures of fossils from early Earth, and he said, those are growing in Antarctic lakes. And it took us years to convince people. He'd been diving in the lakes, um, melt a hole in the ice and send divers down, and they usually come up again through the small hole. So there's a whole adventure there. Um, but, but basically, going to these lakes is like going back to early Earth, where we have a much simpler ecosystem. My view of life in the universe, and I'll talk about why, is looking for something like this. For until 500 million years ago, this is what life on Earth looked like in terms of morphology. It took billions of years until we got to animals. And so when we're talking about all these amazing exoplanets, We'll, we'll, we'll talk more, and the next speaker, will, Jeff, will talk about intelligent life as well. But we're, we're, in some sense, way more likely to have a simple microscopic life. Now, I'm going to talk about these cyanobacteria. They used to be called blue-green algae, but they're clearly bacteria, and cyano means blue-green, so they just shifted their name when we got genomics and can look at what they actually are. Um, because they're, they produce molecular oxygen. And when you have, and we all know that that reacts with things like iron, it forms rusts. And so if you have molecular oxygen and water and rock, they tend to react with each other very quickly. But we have both molecular oxygen and water, and actually methane, which also is a reduced form and reacts with oxygen as well. We have those in our atmosphere because we have the biological processes continually producing the oxygen, which give us this disequilibrium. Molecular oxygen is something that you can see soon, be able to see uh, spectroscopically in exoplanets. And so I want to talk about life in the universe, how we're looking for it. And I want to talk about the origin of oxygen, uh, oxygenic photosynthesis. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the shapes the bacteria make, because we can't actually look for fossil microbial communities on Mars. And we're looking and not finding at the moment, but we've only looked in a very small spot. So I'm going to talk also a little bit about the results from Mars and how we would actually um, look for this life. So I want to start by thinking of life in terms of the Drake equation. So is life a sequence of improbable events or probable events? A lot of times we think about what's the chances of life in the universe. We all want to know. And, and most scientists say, particularly now that we have so many planets and things, oh, there must be life out there. But how much, right? And so, so Drake put together this equation, which is the number of, of uh, civilizations we might actually be able to detect with a, a radio signal, uh, some, some sort of inform, information signal as the product of a bunch of, um, of probabilities. Now, based on our work with extrasolar planets and astronomy, we can estimate the number of suitable stars. Our definition of suitable is shifting with time, but, but we can get some reasonable number. We're understanding that some very large number of those stars have planets, and a substantial percent of them have planets that are like Earth. We don't know about the liquid water yet, right? But, but that's within realm of thousands of planets, and so you can actually do a probability because you have a reasonably large number. Then you get to the second set, where it's a fraction of planets with liquid water that develop life. Well, we have Earth. We now know Mars had liquid water early in its history. We found lots of evidence of rivers and some evidence for lakes. So if we take what we actually know, we either have a probability of one or a probability of one half, right? <laughs> well, zero, we're here, right? I, I, I believe that I'm actually here. So if you t but, but a half seems ridiculous because we don't think it should be that. 
one seems ridiculous because we don't think it should be that, but if we actually look at the data we have, how do you say? Right? And the fraction of life that evolves intelligence, well, if you consider us intelligent, that's one. <laughs> we don't know. We might, it might be a half if we find evidence of, of non-intelligent microbial life on Mars. Um, but you really have to define this. And then the communication depends on the life that evolved and our ability to detect the, the signal. Right? So there are communication forms that are not heard that a, an attempt is made to communicate, but it's not understood because the person, like if I talk to a deaf person and they're not looking at me, they may, they, I'm communicate, I'm trying to communicate, but it's not actually happening. So then we have, so, so I would say that these things are kind of strange to think about in terms of probability from a scientific perspective. They're really, really in the realm of speculation. And then how long a, a civilization lasts depends, again, on a, on a whole lot of assumptions. So what I like to do is instead of thinking of these as a probability, think about them as a, as a system or a process. So there's one of the things that's, that's really nice, there's, there's this really nice essay called Odds by Stanislaw Lem, which is a, a, a book, it's a, a, a review of a fake book by an author who was t talked about all the probability of events that led to his birth, right? It's the, the probability that his mother was born, the probability his father was born, the probability they survived childhood, the probability they met. And you get up with something for an individual where the probability that I exist as me, if I look at it this way, is zero. But you can also think about it that the probability that humans exist or humans will exist in a thousand years is pretty high because there's this organizational system, we have this reproduction, we're pretty good at keeping ourselves alive, and so that someone will exist, right? And so, so there's this difference of the chance of something versus uh, having a sort of a whole natural system that, that perpetuates itself. And so this is where I get into my physics background is because there's this whole sort of nonlinear dynamics emergent pattern way of approaching uh, physics. And so if you think about life as an emergent pattern, not, not as a chance that something happens, but a property of a system, we know that we can get uh, sort of, there are processes that do not involve biology that create organic compounds. So someone was asking about the organics uh, and possibility of life on uh, comets or ices in the solar system. The uh, Rosetta mission has, uh, they haven't released the results yet, but they s basically sniff the organics on the comet and you can make very complicated organic compounds abiotically but on ices with radiation. There's also, a ch you can do that with some interactions of carbon and minerals. So we expect that that happens everywhere in the universe at some level. And those organic compounds, as the planet forms, can be delivered uh, in an appropriate sort of unknown organics in an unknown necessary environment. But we can sort of think about the origin of life as taking these compounds and getting them in the right environment. And since we don't know what this is, I have no idea how likely it is. Um, but then once we sort of have the origin or the concentration of these compounds, we can think about, as scientists, how do you actually get a self-replicating system out of these organic compounds that ends up with reproduction and inheritance and metabolism, which is my definition of life. And I'm starting with organic compounds because I don't know any other chemistry that, that sort of has this property. And so we can look at how the, these organic systems behave and create complex structures or have complex interactions. And we can study that experimentally. 
um, in the lab with chemistry. We can study it um, uh, mathematically and with computational uh, experiments and tests. And we can look at some of the later parts of this by actually looking at the record of life, the record of life on Earth. So I like to think about this earliest stages uh, with work by my colleague Jim Crutchfield um, at UC Davis uh, in the physics department. And he makes what he calls this um, finitary um, uh, soup. I can't remember, but it's got a really funny name. Uh, but, but basically the idea is that he makes these little mathematical computational shapes and he gives them rules for interacting. And um, it's modeled on an organic system but doesn't include the details of the chemistry. And what he does is he puts, makes his recipe, starts out with about 100 uh, different ingredients and in a closed system and he just lets them react. And this is where, say, the, this might be component 17, for example, persists for a long time and then gets consumed. And these dashed lines show what's being made. So the key thing is that through time, in this particular case, he's making about 180 new compounds in the soup, uh, some of which persist and some of which are just sort of transient in there. Right? So we can think about an organic system, if we say, well, each one of these is a molecule that comes uh, from some abiotic process, they all react together and we get something new. Now, if you have a closed system, you eventually reach an equilibrium and you don't have very much in the, in the way of complexity or something that's interesting. But if you have an open system, it can bring new components in, so you bring new energy in, new building blocks in, you can get the more complexity. And you can also, this is, this is sort of a, a soup that's really well mixed in the computer. Um, and there's no spatial dimensions. But if you make it a spatial dimension, you might have, say, this little group working over in here, reacting with each other, another group here. And that's a little bit like you start to get like a cell. So you have different things going on in different places, and uh, which is what what biology actually does. So this is a model where the color represents, say, a group of, of, uh, of uh, interacting soup components here versus another one here. And you sort of have these edges or membranes in these. Now, some of you might have seen some uh, chemical reactions, and I forgot the name of them right at the moment. This happens with chemistry as well, where you get uh, uh, regions with different sorts of chemical reactions and boundaries between them that shift back and forth depending on what you add, add to the system. And so the, the key idea is that you can do this computationally or chemistry, but there's, there's fundamental behaviors that lead to patterns. And the key thing is that those must happen in organic systems to actually get life. And so I like to think of the, the uh, good scientific way to address the question of are we alone in the universe is to think about how you actually get patterns in these simple systems that could lead to something uh, that evolves through time. Okay? So I like to think of sort of this whole question of astrobiology is, uh, is thinking about life as one of these catalytic systems. Now, I also like working on really specific projects as well. And so I'm going to talk about two practical questions that are sort of after related, after life uh, evolved. One is the production of oxygen. And we can look at that, as I said before, in the cyanobacteria that evolved to do that. Um, and then we can also look at some of these really beautiful communities that might get fossilized uh, that we could uh, look for on Mars. Okay. So uh, cyanobacteria uh, basically took two different chemical systems, uh, photosystem one and photosystem two, from different photosynthetic bacteria. So there, there are actually numerous types of photosynthesis, only one of which produces oxygen. Other systems work on iron and sulfur. And the genes for these 
two systems are found in different types of bacteria. And the uh, evolutionary advance that cyanobacteria did was basically take the genes from one organism and then another organism make this whole s system and couple it together. And that allowed them to get a huge amount of energy by taking water and creating molecular oxygen, um, uh, which sort of increased their ability to grow. And then it also produced this molecular oxygen, which is a really, really strong signature of life on Earth. Uh, the, there are abiotic processes that produce a little bit of oxygen, but not nearly uh, the level that we have now. So basically, we have this interesting thing where our production of oxygen came from one organism taking a part of two different organisms and putting them together. And this, and, um, this is one of the things I'm working on, and um, I'm going to step through this chart a couple of times, things at a time. So this is measured from the, s the genomes of the bacteria, and it sort of shows the family tree. So things that are closer together are more closely related. These are the photosynthetic bacteria that produce oxygen. And then these are these things called melanobacteria, which were only first described in the literature last year. So this is really brand new. Um, and they are the closest relatives to the cyanobacteria of all other organisms. So all other bacteria are like way down over here, if with this distance representing uh, relatedness. Right? So what w uh, how are they different? Um, so this tree is made, this distance is defined by uh, a specific set of genes. And then functionally, they're different, which is what I'll just get to, OK? And how are they different is the most important question one of my students is asking about this, because it may tell us about the evolution of cyanobacteria. Yeah. So all of these guys up here, all the cyanobacteria proper, produce oxygen, and they have photosystem one and two. All of the ones that people have looked at of the melanobacteria require an anoxic environment. The oxygen actually poisons them. There are a few that can handle a little bit of oxygen, and none of them that they've found are photosynthetic. So the closest relatives to the most important photosynthetic organisms for us to actually be here don't like their relatives, right? There was some huge division <laughs> in the family tree <laughs> that allowed these guys to control the world. And actually, so far, and I'll tell I'll sh you guys are going to be some of the first scientists to actually know about this exception, unless people heard my talk in December. Um, most of these guys are found in things like the guts of animals. So there are actually some inside your gut. And they used to think that they, when they looked at the genes, they used to think it was the remnants of food because they looked like the cyanobacteria, which have genes like in plants, right? And, um, and so it turns out that these guys, people have only looked for these in very strange, strange sorts of environments. It turns out that that first picture I showed was from this Lake Vanda in Antarctica. It turns out, so these pinnacles, I forgot to say, they're only about this tall. They're not actually church spires in an ancient civiliz uh, uh, extrasolar uh, civilization. But it turns out that there are a lot of those melanobacteria inside these photosynthetic communities. And so getting at how they're different is one of the things that, that my lab group is looking at. So this is one of those pinnacles cut open. And I, I like color because it's easy to look for, right? And so what we found is like most microbial communities are laminated. And the, the colors are pigments uh, that absorb light in this case. So the brown outside has a little bit of photosynthetic activity. The green and pink areas have more. They're both photosynthetic, um, but they have slightly different organisms. And this is the percent of different types of organisms that we found in the genetics. 
So all of these are the cyanobacteria, and the ones in purple are the ones to pay attention to. These are these melanobacteria, and they're mostly in these pink layers inside the pinnacles. Now, we also measured the oxygen in these, and there's lots of oxygen going all the way into here in the summer when we measured it. So we only go in the summer when it's daylight 100% of the time, and photosynthesis is going crazy, and these guys produce a huge amount of oxygen. Conversely, in the winter, it's dark 100% of the time. Photosynthesis stops. Uh, we know from uh, previous workers who've looked at the lake chemistry first thing in the um, spring, as early and as, as you can get in there, that there's still oxygen in the water. But we think the middle of this pinnacle might go anoxic in the winter. We're um, trying to get uh, funding to go to another lake and put in overwinter monitors that are automatic. Um, so we can actually uh, test and see what happens. But, Sorry. Yeah. These are they solid? Are they, 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 they're, they're, they're like jello. So these little white specks are minerals that are precipitating in them. So they have little teeny crunchy bits in them. And they hold their shape really way, well. But if you, when you hold one, you could shake it and it would, it would move a little bit. So it's like, it's like pretty firm jello. Yeah. They don't, because the light, they're, they're under ice, and um, they're in very dim light. And that light is very blue. And so they developed very specific pigments to absorb the light that they get. And what you're seeing here is the green, the green is a regular chlorophyll. But the pink is this accessory light-absorbing uh, pigment that they that they collect the light with and then they send it to the chlorophyll. So um, we uh, we've uh, measured their photosynthetic potential by shining light on them and looking at them fluoresce. And there are photo there is photosynthetic potential in this zone here. And based on the oxygen, we think that they're doing it. Um, but they have all these special pigments to take advantage of the light they get. Yeah. Right, so that, that's, that, that is um, the fundamental ecological question that we're asking here. Is that the environment, oh the, the, oh, the question was, is there a symbiotic uh, relationship between what happens in the summer and what happens in the winter? And um, we, we know that the photosynthesizers are not photosynthesizing in the winter. And so, but other organisms are, that are uh, consuming the oxygen and doing some other things are likely to be active in the, in the winter as well. And so what, to, to really, I mean, it's great. I really, really like going to these lakes in the summer when it, the, the temperatures get up to zero Celsius. Um, <laughs> in the winter, you really can't do the work. So that's one of the things that no one has worked on these in the winter. And we want to actually use some of the sort of space um, uh, technology that people are developing to, to uh, explore planets in our solar system and, and deploy them here over winter because it's not accessible to people. Yeah. Right, but these questions you're asking about how are the melanobacteria different, what's happening with the ecology, are the research questions we're working on right now. And so we don't have the answers to those yet, but they're really natural and important questions. And what we hoped, what we're, what we're working on right now is, is we can do much more genomic sequencing of these bacteria, and the genes and the bacteria say something about the function, what they can actually do. So we're going to do what we call metagenomics on these. And we have all sorts of different organisms in there, so there are a lot of tricks you have to do uh, to, to figure out what the melanobacteria can do. But we hope to see what they're doing. And then we hope to see how they're different from cyanobacteria. And usually, related organisms came from, that came from a common ancestor, they share characteristics. And you can look for those characteristics and try to figure out what those common ancestors did. And then maybe we can figure out why they actually evolved to produce oxygen. Right. And so 
by by looking at these, we might actually get at this idea of molecular oxygen. Is it a really unlikely event? Um, or is it something that we would actually expect to happen on other planets? My guess, because these really closely related bacteria don't appear to be photosynthetic all, at all, and the cyanobacteria put, took parts of genes from other organisms, it doesn't seem likely to me right now. But I could easily flip my decision if it turns out that sharing information, it, like with genes, is really common, and this sort of process is, is uh, something that's likely to happen in a carbon system. Right? So, so I'm definitely keeping an open mind, and I think that looking at this is really important because this is, again, the exoplanet atmospheres. It's something that will be really, really interesting to see if we start seeing oxygen and reduced carbon, say methane and water in these atmospheres, it may really change the way we think about, about molecular oxygen. Okay. Yeah, the other one I'm going to say is, is oh, do, would, do we expect life, microbial life elsewhere to look like on, it does on Earth? So a biosignature is a pattern that requires biology to form. That's sort of how we define it. And this is a stromatolite, and it's about two and a half billion years old uh, from South Africa. And it has these layers, and there's little bits of organic matter in it, and there are crystals of the mineral calcite that grew on them, and then this is uh, sand that settled in down between them. And so is this something that one would get on another planet? If I saw this on Mars, would I say there's evidence of life on Mars, right? Some of these patterns, like I'm really sure that this one formed with biology, but some of them you can actually get uh, in uh, car paint shops, for example, you can get similar sorts of stromatolites made up of different paint layers as the paint spray goes somewhere else. I mean, that's still biosignature because, of course, we built the paint shop. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you can also like malachite. It's beautiful black and green banded mineral that formed in conditions that are probably too hot for life, right? And so it has this relationship to the stromatolites. But then there are other things. Now, these are from different lakes in Antarctica where, like, these sorts of pinnacles, I don't know of any sort of abiotic process that could make them. Uh, this is the pan is sediment, and each one of these squares here is a centimeter. This is a gas bubble with uh, oxygen and nitrogen in it, and it's tethered to the ground by bacteria. So the, the bubble formed in the mat, and it lifted it up, and the bacteria sort of keep stretching up, and they're still growing. And, and I don't think you could form something like that um, uh, uh, abi abiotically. And then we get cones and peaks and all sorts of, of uh, funky things. Yeah? Just for the gas bubble, that, that's fascinating. Is, is the composition of the mat down at the bottom different from the composition of the mat you know, at the very tip of the bubble, which is near the surface? Or does that get bigger? Does it touch the surface? Yeah, so it, it, this, is, this is in seven meters of water. So the, and, and it's about, it looks like it's about uh, 15 centimeters high. And, um, and then there's like a smaller one here uh, with a bubble. So my students actually, I didn't get to go this year, but they collected this in a tube and froze it, and it's on a ship on the way to our lab. <laughs> right? and, and from what they, they, and they studied some in the, in the lab tent in the field, and, and the bacteria look pretty similar at the top and the bottom, but, but that's one of the things that we're really looking at is, is it turns out like these little peaks have different, uh, di uh, I should say, the rounded mounds here have certain types of bacteria that are absent from the peaks. The guys in the peaks here are present in the mounds as well, but the, the, the individual types of bacteria are different in different parts of these things in some, in some places. What are the temperatures of the mound? Um, oh, this, okay, so Lake Vanda is considered very warm by the divers. It's four degrees Celsius. Uh, Lake Joyce is zero degrees Celsius, it's, uh, and uh, Lake Untersea, I think, was about two 
degrees Celsius. Yeah, so they go, they wear dry suits and they go um, down and if they're active, they can stay down for about 40 minutes. Um, if they're doing detailed measurements of oxygen gradients, 20 minutes and they're, you know, they're cold and need to come up, yeah. It's, um, so, uh, if, you, if you search for, for my name, I, I have a blog and a link to my student's blog, and there's lots of really cool pictures of how we actually do this. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things we're looking at is why do some of these bacteria form peaks and some form flat areas? And so these, these are um, two computational models here. And basically what they are is they're, they're sort of sticks or threads. And like um, if you just jiggle sticks back and forth, they sort of align with each other, but they get spaced out. So like um, pick up sticks, you know, towards the end, they're aligned and hard to pick up, right? So if you actually make them behave like bacteria and move parallel to the elongation, it's easier for a bacteria to propel itself uh, if it's a filament, a long shape, um, parallel to elongation because there's very little surface area at the end and there's lots of room to push. So if you take them and you make them pretty stiff, what happens is they end up clumping together. Yeah, I'll stop this. They end up clumping together and individuals can move and they move sort of along these ridges but then through time as they grow, the areas with more organisms grow faster and you end up producing a ridge here with a low inside. Different bacteria behave differently. So I'm gonna run this movie now. This movie, the bacteria are really flexible and uh, when, they, when they collide with each other, they, they sort of bend and clump around and you get a, a different pattern, right? So basically this is the same, the same number of, uh, of bacteria, but you give them uh, a different behavior and they make a little bit of a different pattern. I can imagine if this one grew, you'd end up with uh, maybe really tightly spaced walls with uh, smaller lows between them. It turns out oops, that we can do this with real bacteria in the lab. And so this is some of the filamentous bacteria mixed in with sand. And we did time-lapse photography. And in the space of 20 hours, they weren't getting that much um, energy to grow, but you end up making those same sorts of patterns. And when you look at these bacteria, they're going parallel to elongation and they bend sort of a medium amount. Right? So it was actually the experiments that motivated uh, the computational models. And those computational models weren't mine, but I've worked on, worked on some that are similar. And then we see some of those patterns in these Antarctic lakes. So here, this, um, each one of these is about two centimeters high. And if you look down on it, it has sort of that honeycomb pattern a little bit. And you end up with these high areas and these low areas. And then I have another student working on fossils um, from South Africa um, where, and this is, this is looking at a vertical cut. Um, we, we think that these actually have, have the same sort of shape. Now I can promise you that the organisms that I used in the lab are not the same as the ones here and they're definitely not the ones that were present two and a half billion years ago. There's been two and a half billion years of evolution since then. So we have computational models. We have some bacteria experiments. We have modern microbial mats and we have these ancient microbial mats. So my thought is that if you end up with filaments in a microbial community, they're likely to make some of these patterns, right? So it's something that we could actually look for. Now, I didn't mention this, but one of the things that happens is if you have a lot of sediment coming down, it just compacts the microbial communities and you don't get any of these patterns, right? So you have to have a sort of a special environment for them to form where the biology can express itself without sand and mud coming in on top of them. 
And to turn them into fossils, you have to have minerals form um, on them itself. So this is what I'm looking for on Mars. But we have to find the right environment. And we have actually recently found what we think is a thick section of uh, lake sediments. And this is uh, a selfie of our rover, Curiosity. Its goal is to look for habitable environments. And we consider lakes um, habitable environments. They have good, um, nice water. And there's energy source, because we have iron minerals around. And there's uh, carbon and other things, um, other things around. So this is my uh, other project that I'm working a lot on. And what, we're, what, I, what I, we're hoping to find on Mars is a, an environment with little physical disruption. So if you have currents or waves, they also break up the microbial systems. Uh, low sedimentation. And hopefully, you actually have minerals forming on them. So we found so far uh, river and lake sediments. Um, we have an area with little physical disruption where we are right now. We don't know what the rates of sediment coming in are, but we think it's a, it's a little bit too high. And we have precipitation of minerals, but it doesn't seem to be quite at the right time uh, to capture this. Um, so I'm going to give, just give a little bit about the mission. This is um, a Gale Crater. It's about 150 kilometers across. And this is our landing ellipse. And we landed uh, right in here, and we've been driving uh, drove over to uh, Mount Sharp. So Mount Sharp here is um, a couple kilometers high, and it has layers of rocks, a lot like the Grand Canyon. So the idea is we can we can uh, work our way up the mountain and interpret the environmental change through time on Mars, another planet. It's just amazing. So this is this is where we've gone so far. We landed here. And we went uh, to the west to look at some alluvial fan deposits. And we found some lake deposits there. And then we drove all the way across here. And almost every single deposit we saw was deposited by a river. And you could tell that by the, grains, the size of the sand grains and the, the, the basically that makes dune shapes and ripple shapes in it. And there's some channels. And so we, we're sure we have lots of liquid water. Um, and we're going up in elevation. And then when we got right, to, this is the base of Mount Sharp. The black here are black sand dunes uh, from windblown sand. When we got here, we found lake deposits again. And that's what we're working on right now. Yep. How much distance is that? Uh, this is, um, uh, we're at uh, almost 11 kilometers along the route, wheel odometry. Um, and I think straight line distance is closer to eight and a half. It took us much longer than we had hoped, because there are lots of little pointy rocks that are putting holes in our tires. So we've been trying to avoid that. <laughs> right, so here's, here's some of the evidence uh, for the, the river deposits. Um, and we think we've gone into a delta. You can see that there are layers of rocks that are dipping here. Um, and there's sort of a boundary between here. This is from a, 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 a dune in the river migrating. And it shows the direction of of, uh, tran of flow of the water, which is uh, from the right uh, to the left here. And it's going right towards the mountain. And everyone knows that water flows downhill. So the mountain wasn't there when this happened. And so we're looking at things that happened before very early in the history of, of the Gale Crater. And then right next to that, we see these really, really, really finely laminated rocks with very little physical disruption. And the easiest way to get lamina like this is to have mud settling out from standing water. And this could be pul from pulses of water coming in, bringing mud in, or um, it could be seasonal. Uh, we don't have any idea of how long it took. Yeah? It, how has that been exposed then, if it settled out? Yeah, so it's been exposed by wind erosion a much younger time. So basically, we have, it's a, it's, um, we have layers and layers and layers of rock. And the oldest ones are on the bottom. And then some unknown process that we're, we argue about a lot <laughs> removed a lot of the sand and mud and, and had to blow it out of the crater. There's no river cutting through the crater out the other side. And, so, and, then, and then when you look at the details of like this little bit sticking out, those are oriented to the wind direction that, that, um, 
that uh, uh, goes around the mountain. There's certain, certain uh, wind patterns you get with topography. And so we know that it's been exposed recently uh, by the wind. Yeah. Yeah. Is there an implication that the atmosphere was once thicker? Because right now, wind would be kind of mineral. Right. So, so in, this, in this particular crater, those sand dunes are still blowing. And, and so we think that there's still wind erosion. We're, very, we're um, at a very low elevation. And so the atmosphere is a little bit denser. And uh, the winds are high enough to move sand and erode some of these rocks. Um, but if you have liquid water, y you pretty much have to have a higher atmospheric density. Um, because there's not enough gas for the greenhouse effect, right? So you, you basically any liquid water would immediately boil and freeze <laughs> because of the heat exchange. So you, you end up with sort of that happening simultaneously. So, so the atmospheric pressure must have been different. Yeah. Okay, so we've been looking in these rocks, and we do have evidence of mineral precipitation. This is our microscopic imager, and so that is the size of a penny relative to these little things. And we see these little white um, crystals in the rock. And um, we aren't 100% sure what mineral they are yet. We do have an X-ray diffraction instrument that will give us mineralogy. Um, but the way we do that is we just drill a hole in this and collect the powder and measure the whole thing. We, we think that they're a sulfate mineral, and we just drilled another sample this last week, and we're deli we delivered it to the, app, to the instrument today, and we'll get the results on the first order results on Monday. So, so we're hoping that we can get these uh, understanding of the minerals that are forming. Um, but we don't actually see these. We think that these grew within the mud. And so we don't actually think we have the ability to preserve any microbial structures um, if they were there. So we're we think because we have both river and lake deposits, we think we're near a delta mouth, which has high sedimentation rates. So if there were a microbial community, they'd probably be compacted. And we don't think we have the right minerals forming. And then we also have an iron oxide called hematite which reacts with organic matter commonly. So we don't think we'd find organic matter in these, in these sediments. Um, but we think that the environment is generally good, and we can certainly see if we had any of these microbial mats fossilized, we have the instrumentation uh, to see it. So we're, we're sort of like way down here, and we have all of these rocks to look at. And our rover is tall. Whoops. Oh, I took it out. Ah, that little spot right there is the size of our rover. So this is really like the Grand Canyon. We have lots and lots of, we have more rocks to look at than we will ever be able to see. So what, what I'm really hoping is, and, and from our images from orbit, we think that there are some variations in here. Okay. So, so there's a chance. I mean, we can actually look for these on another planet. Which, which is really exciting. So I want to go back to a sample that we drilled up here, because this gets back to the idea of, of a soup. So s sample analysis at Mars, otherwise known as SAM, has mass spectrometers that can look at, look for, and characterize organic compounds. And in one of our samples, we found carbon. This is a carbon atom, a hydrogen, and a chlorine atom. And so this would be a methyl chlorine. It's a carbon uh, with one hydrogen replaced by chlorine. And then we're seeing some of these others uh, to larger extents. Now, unfortunately, we have some contamination in the instrument uh, from an organic solvent that we brought with us. So it's a little bit complicated, and the team's being really careful. But there are a couple of compounds that, that we've seen the we know the chlorine is from Mars, and there are a couple compounds that we've seen that we think are Martian organics, but we're not 100% sure yet. We're trying to do some extra blanks and extra analyses. Um, probably in the next six months, we'll actually have a press release on, on more of the details of, of, of these organics. Um, but we're thinking there should be organics on Mars because there are organics in meteorites and on comets, and we know that those have hit Mars. So we have 
sort of uh, uh, solar system organics that should have come to the surface of Mars. So we don't really have any evidence that these are from life, but we are thinking that there are organic compounds on Mars. And so it's potential that there's one of these primordial uh, catalytic soups on Mars. We know that it got organic matter delivered, and we don't know what happens to organic carbon on a planet uh, that doesn't have life. Yeah? Um, I'm guessing because of the high pressure of chlorate, that's why the organics seem to be chlorated. Is there any way to, relatively speaking, date when they might have reacted with the organic material? They, they pop, there's no way to date when the chlorine reacted with the organic molecules. So the problem is that we don't have any graduate students on Mars to process the samples. And so we have, we have two, we basically take a scoop of dirt and heat it up in an oven and it's very reactive. And so those probably were chlorinated when we were analyzing the sample, but it, we don't, we can't eliminate that that didn't happen before. So what the team's doing to, to look at that is we're, so this, this compound that's contaminating the rocks is very good at breaking up complicated organic molecules. So, so what we've done is we've taken a sample, and for our other samples, we've figured out how to reduce the amount of contamination. So we've taken one sample and put it in the maximum contamination spot. So you actually get the contaminant on it, and it reacts with the sample, and we get different results. And so by, instead of heating it up, reacting it, with the compound, we're getting different results. And by trying to reconcile those two, we'll know more about whether the chlorine came from the heating, um, how much of the, the sample, the organics are coming from the contamination. It's, it's a real detective game doing that. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, this is actually my last slide. Uh, for the main part of the talk. So basically, so when I think of life in the universe as a scientist, I mean, as, as you know, a, a human being, I want there to be life. I want to know it. I want there to be intelligent life. There are all sorts of things. But as a scientist, I like to think of it as a primordial soup with an emergent property of catalytic system. And we know it happened at least once on Earth. And, and Mars either had soup or life, right? We, there were organics there. There have been. We don't know if that catalytic process happened, but we're asking that question in a really rigorous scientific way. Uh, biological oxygen production, it's a fairly complicated evolutionary path, happened at least once. I'm going to guess that it's a rare event, but it would be really nice to be wrong because oxygen is this really huge source of, of, of energy for larger organisms uh, like ourselves. And uh, we know it happened at least once. So thanks. Thank you, Don. Questions? Yeah. Would you comment on the, I mean, on the Martian meteorites that you can put into labs with graduate students. The big fuss about 10 years ago about the possible fossils on Martian meteorites, and you know, what do you think? Yeah, so, so the problem with the, the um, reports on possible fossils is that the, um, it, it goes back to, in my mind to the probability argument. <laughs> There were lots of things that said, this is probably a fossil, this is probably a fossil, this is a pro a, but, but none of them were good. And they added them all up to get likely life as opposed to multiplying them all, right? <laughs> which gives you a teeny probability. I mean, you don't multiply probabilities that way. But, but you can't say, what, what they, what, in my mind what they did is they had all this disparate evidence that wasn't connected together to make a good story. They just put different things together. And none of those, none of the components are compelling as evidence for life. And, but those are also really the wrong rocks to be looking at because they're, they're um, igneous rocks. They're, they're from deep in Mars that were ejected during an impact. And it's really hard to find evidence for life on Earth from that type of rock on Earth. 
and we've been saturated with life for billions of years. So it's really more like the places like the lake deposits and things like that that are good to look at, and there's no way those would ever survive a, an impact and, and get, get to Earth. I have a technical question about the um, QMS data. Could you go back to that slide? Mm -hmm. So um, it says retention time. Is this is this uh, connected to a chromatograph? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this went through uh, a QMS into the chromatograph. Into a, okay. Yeah. And then did you I. I did you say the chlorine may or may not have been on the surface? It may have been the, a part of the... The chlorine is from Mars. We don't have a source of chlorine contamination. Uh -huh. um, uh, but the question is the organics it's reacting with. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? So, so one thing is to find evidence of life. Um, can, but can we rule out that Mars could not have looked like, like early Mars could not have looked like early Earth. Can we rule that out? Does it look like it was a sterile environment for the most part? It couldn't have been kind of a living world. Maybe life hid out in niches, but I mean, what can we rule out? Right, so it's really, really hard to prove the absence of something. And the rocks that we're looking at here are all older probably than 3.8 billion years old. And our oldest rock on Earth is 4 billion years old, and we have not, almost nothing that's that old because of plate tectonics and our very active hydrologic cycle. So we don't know really what the, the period of Earth from the moon forming event to 4 billion, sort of 3.5 billion years ago, we don't really know what early Earth was like. And we don't really know when life first became abundant during that period. I think by 3.5 billion years on Earth, we have good evidence of microbial life. Um, and, and so by going to Mars, we're, we're looking at a different time slice of the solar system. Um, so it had, this is, we, it had rivers and lakes. Um, it didn't have land plants, but early Earth didn't either. Yeah. The dark material in this photograph, I think you said what it was. but Yeah, it, it is a sand dune. So you can see a little hint of some crests here. Has it been, has it been sampled by Curiosity? <laughs> Not yet. We're here, and we're driving this way. And um, the, the, from, from orbital signatures, it has olivine, which is that FESIO um, two or four that was the rock in the extrasolar planet diagram, right? <laughs> and, and, and they're moving. And so that, that will be something that we'll sample uh, when we get there. Yeah. How, how do you date uh, uh, rocks on Mars? Well, we didn't think we could. <laughs> um, but we tried. Our mass spectrometer can concentrate noble gases. And uh, potassium decays to argon. And so you can look at the argon 3940 ratios. And we did that for one of our samples. And we got the age of the solar system with huge errors, right? <laughs> so, so basically, you take everything you've learned about planet formation here, and there's so much that happens right at the very beginning. The minerals in our sandstones are that age of the solar system, roughly, plus or minus. 100 million years, which considering it's the first time we even tried it on Mars, and the second time we didn't do as well as <laughs> the first time. But right, so that's the age of the grains themselves. Also, there's cosmic radiation that produces um, xenon and helium in the upper meter or so of the soil. Neutrons can get in about that far. And based sort of in this area labeled Yellowknife Bay, we, we got an age from the helium and xenon that said the rocks were only exposed on the order of 100 million years ago, um, and uh, up to this 
first meet or the surface. So this t gets at that, that idea of the wind erosion. We think that the rocks were recently exposed from wind erosion. In a, in a planetary sense, 100 million years <laughs> is, is, is fairly recent. But, but that was short enough time that um, there might not have been very much degradation of the organics from the radiation. And that's actually the sample we're seeing the hints of the organics in. So it's, this, it's making this, this consistent story. Um, we don't know when the rivers flowed, <laughs> but that's a huge problem on Earth, even getting that. Because when you date the minerals, you're getting the age of the minerals, not when the river flowed. No. Yeah. Thank you for your <clears throat> doubly interesting talk, the two different topics. Um, going back to the first one, the um, melanobacteria. Um, there's evidence that uh, the cyanobacteria of a very ancient lineage, perhaps billions of years old, um, is there any information about how old the melanobacteria are? Are they, could they be relatively new, or are they also ancient? Um, the last common ancestor between them is older than both the melanobacteria and the cyanobacteria, and the evolutionary distances are fairly small. So I, 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 I th that sort of requires that they emerged at about the same time. So one of the other things that I'm Working. I love working with people who specialize in things I want to know the answer to. And so um, the, the, the cyanobacteria make specific cell wall component, lipids or components that can be preserved in organic, ancient organic matter in rocks. Um, and so one of the questions I wrote an email from the back of the room today on was asking someone who knows a little bit more about the melanobacteria if they make that same compound, right? And so, so that... If they both make that compound, uh, we can't necessarily separate them out. But if the cyanobacteria got that unique skill as well, we might be able to tell more about that relationship. Can I follow up on a wild speculative question? Um, the idea of endosymbiosis, right? Mm -hmm. The cyanobacteria are heavily involved in that. Would these melanobacteria possibly also play an interesting role? Could they have led to a different organelle? So based on their genetics and the genetics we know from the organelles, it's unlikely because um, they are, they've only been discovered in the last couple of years because they're so similar to cyanobacteria, people assume that they were cyanobacteria. And like the mitochondria and some of these other organelles, the genomics are different and they put them in a different class of bacteria. It could very well be though that there's something about that group of bacteria that allowed them to steal the genes from other photosynthesizers and become an organelle. They're, they're, that, that, that shows a lot of, of uh, appreciation for the d diversity of life, right? They're, they're, they're taking and giving a lot. Yeah. One last question. Okay. Jack, Jack, um, I was curious, so with the melanobacteria, you had mentioned um, that the cyanobacteria had borrowed one photosystem dependent on iron, another dependent on sulfur. Um, presumably, you might imagine that some of that's due to the relative abundance of those two minerals. Um, but to what extent might the, the chemistry itself be flexible and you might get photosynthetic systems or could presumably have gotten photosynthetic systems using other minerals yeah. as a starting point which might expand your... Right. So iron and sulfur are particularly good because iron goes from the oxid 2 plus to 3 plus oxidation state really well. So it's really easy to change an electron there. Sulfur is really nice because it goes uh, from minus 2 to plus 6 and it oxidizes very rapidly, but the reduction side of it is, is kinetically very, very slow. And so it's really very, very good metabolically for the bacteria um, uh, uh, because of that, the, the slow kinetics of, of the electron exchange. So if I was going to pick a microbial metabolism, it would be related to iron and sulfur. So I think those are like super good for photosynthesis and all sorts of other things. Manganese is what the uh, cyanobacteria use to br help break the water, and that's another one of these sort of redox sensitive elements. So, so I think that's a really, I don't, I think that's a really good way to think about what might happen in in other places, is, is thinking about those redox things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Yeah. Thank you.
speaker has disappeared. Oh, there he is. Uh, so our next speaker, um, Jeff Marcy, Professor Jeff Marcy, is a professor um, at UC Berkeley. He holds the Alberts Chair, which is dedicated to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, Jeff is one of the pioneers in the discovery of planets around other stars than our own. Uh, and uh, this includes... Um, the discovery of the first multi-planet system, the discovery of the first uh, planet outside our solar system with the mass of Saturn, and the discovery of the first planet outside our solar system with the mass of Neptune. So that's quite a set of planets. Uh, his, his research is now focused on the search for Earth-sized planets around other stars. Uh, he was the co-investigator of Kepler, which you've heard mentioned. Uh, this is the NASA space telescope that is dedicated to identifying Earth-like and habitable planets. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Marcy has uh, more honors than I can uh, mention in a short introduction. Uh, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he's a recipient, among other things, of the Carl Sagan Prize for uh, Science Popularization and the NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement. And so he's going to talk to us today about intelligent life in the Milky Way galaxy. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>